20 years after regulation forever changed the asbestos industry, the buildings once at the center of the controversy now lay abandoned, but are no less a threat. Asbestos manufacturing was at its height some 50 years ago. At the time, asbestos was being pressed, spun, and woven into a number of products, from brake shoes to roofing materials, from insulation to gloves. Production soared until the 1970s when it was shown that asbestos was linked to cancer of the respiratory and digestive systems. In 1986, OSHA regulations significantly reduced tolerable exposure levels in the workplace. And finally, in 1989, the EPA ordered a 94% reduction in the manufacture, use, and export of asbestos-containing materials, ACM. As a result of regulatory changes and a change in attitudes toward the use of asbestos, many manufacturing sites closed their doors and abandoned their facilities. One such facility is the Southern Asbestos Site in Bennettsville, South Carolina. In 1976, the facility went bankrupt, um, and, the, and the property and the facility were sold at an auction, um, and actually were sold to an auction company. Um, for about, since then, for about 22 years, the facility has been sitting here, dilapidated, um, and uh, in very bad shape. A local citizen in Bennettsville, a former employee of the, the facility, wrote President Clinton a letter, um, and then we, of course, got a White House control document down back to um, our waste division, and we came out and did an assessment in May of 97, um, and we found out that there was a uh, danger to um, public health and the environment posed by the site. The principal danger posed by asbestos is fibers that enter the body through the respiratory or digestive systems. Once in the body, asbestos fibers can embed themselves in the tissue linings, tearing at them, and over time may cause a mutation of the cells, which may result in cancer. Just entering a building known to contain asbestos can stir up the tiny dust-like fibers. Now imagine the wind whipping through one of these buildings, or children finding their way in and scattering debris. This is what frightens area residents. Responding to their concerns, the first step toward remediating these larger-scale abandoned sites is containment. Through a process that has become a standard procedure, the contaminated area is completely sealed off from the environment. This is done by building barriers as necessary using studded frames and reinforced polyethylene sheeting. The area is then put under negative pressure, a mild vacuum, to prevent fibers from escaping through doorways or through tears in the sheeting material. The work crews wear full face respirators and must shower after each exit from the containment zone. To minimize the movement of asbestos fibers, all surfaces are wetted down prior to being cleaned with a high-efficiency particulate air vacuum. In some cases, depending on the nature of the contamination, the surfaces are scraped, scrubbed, and rinsed both before and after being vacuumed. All the ACM collected from the cleanup effort is placed in specially marked bags or is carefully wrapped in plastic sheeting and then shipped off-site for disposal in a properly licensed waste facility. Following a final wash, a sealant material is applied to all available surfaces. This step effectively seals in any fibers remaining after removal. Large, cleaned pieces of metal, masonry, and other useful material are salvaged for reuse. In some cases, the buildings that remain following an asbestos abatement effort can be reoccupied without fear of a health risk. Otherwise, the buildings are demolished, the rubble safely disposed of, and the property restored to allow for new development. But just as there are these standard practices, there are also unique situations requiring some innovative thinking. What we do here is try to recirculate our own water within the area, uh, within the hot zone or exclusion zone, uh, to avoid using city water constantly and then just discharging it to the water treatment system here. As you've seen, safely removing asbestos involves the extensive use of water. Water is used to wet down an area to minimize the movement of fibers into the breathing zone or out of the building. 
For smaller jobs, the management of water is minimal. Excess water can be mopped up with the debris and bagged for disposal. Larger jobs, however, often result in the daily use of thousands of gallons of water. This much contaminated water needs to be collected and treated for reuse. We uh, collect water uh, from various points within the site, bring it to this big blue tank right here, and from there we pump it into a batch tank. It's about a 1,500-gallon tank, and that tank uh, we call it a batch treatment tank. And from there, we pump it through two sand filters, just typical pool sand filters. And then after that, we pump it through three bag filters, which have a nylon mesh. Uh, one micron is the lowest, 15 microns is the highest. And finally, we have a carbon, uh, carbon absorption unit, which will remove any VOC, volatile organic compounds. We discharge it into an effluent storage tank, which is about a 5,000 gallon tank. And this water is distributed to several places within the site to use for quote unquote clean water. This clean water, as it's being referred to, is really the treated water and is suitable only for wetting or cleaning additional asbestos contaminated areas of the site. Over the course of a six month operation, this water may be recycled as many as 50 times. When it comes to larger manufacturing sites, asbestos contamination isn't necessarily limited to the plant itself. Often there is collateral contamination. This can be the result of fibers that were blown from the plant, eventually settling on homes and in yards, mismanaged waste streams. And also, it was quite common for workers at these plants to take the material home with them. Asbestos waste from the site um, was uh, given to uh, some of the former employees to be used as insulation in their homes. Um, unfortunately, back um, in the 60s, people didn't know any better, so they took it and, and put it in between their walls and in their attic and, and used it as insulation. Now, we're going to be relocating the two residences where we found asbestos in their walls and in their ceiling. Um, those folks are going to be staying in town here. Um, the, uh, the contractor uh, that EPA has will be packing and uh, moving their items into a, a local storage uh, facility um, while they'll be doing the work. Soils from both the facilities and the adjacent communities can also show a significant percent of asbestos contamination. Again, this contamination can be the result of mismanagement or common practices and attitudes at the time. In the case of the Johns Manville site in Nashua, New Hampshire, Waste from the manufacture of asbestos tabletops has been the focus of more than one cleanup effort. And this waste material was distributed th throughout the region here as, as a solid waste for, for filling backyards and so forth and created a lot of environmental health threats which we've addressed in the past. But the water was discharged into the Nashua River which is right to the right of us. When we took a survey out there and we, we identified uh, concentrations as high as 80% of asbestos, chrysotile asbestos in the river, and hopefully uh, at some point in time uh, we will return to address that. It's not unusual for a large-scale cleanup effort to require years of follow-up investigation or to expand into areas that aren't strictly limited to the mechanics of removing the contamination. Often it involves a significant community relations effort as well. When it comes to asbestos, People who may have worked at a given site are now afraid of what may be happening to them 30, even 40 years after the fact. They've heard bits and pieces of what asbestos exposure may mean, but they haven't had an opportunity to get current information on their risks, their situation, and what the hazards really are. My role in the asbestos cleanup effort is a community relations specialist. Uh, go around and talk with the residents in the area and let them know what's going on at the site and if we'll be needing to do any cleanup like in their yards or um, in their homes. It's very important that they feel comfortable with asking us questions and feel like they're getting all the information that they, they need to feel good about what we're doing. Um, a lot of people will come in and just, you know, ask sometimes the same questions over and over, but if they feel like, you know, that they're getting information and that it, it doesn't bother us to explain that to them, then that, you know, that makes them very happy. Public meetings are at the heart of most community relations efforts, but not all members of the community will attend a meeting, regardless of how close to home it may be held. To complement these meetings, the communications officers have successfully employed flyers, newspaper articles, radio and television spots, and even websites 
all in an effort to proactively reach out to the community. We've also produced a newsletter uh, in conjunction with uh, EPA and uh, also the Department of Environmental Services here in New Hampshire. Every two weeks, a thousand copies of the newsletter are distributed to local businesses and, thro and throughout the area. It informs the public as to what is happening at the site and what future activities will be happening. And just as important as communicating information is acquiring it. When we initially came here, we did uh, 80 some odd interviews with the uh, local residences and also former employees of the plant. From those interviews, we obtained knowledge that during the operation of the plant that there was a lot of fibers that were floating around in the atmosphere. Um, and then after a big uh, windstorm or, or big rain or something that people would have, those fibers um, accumulated on their screens and they would be sweeping them up inside their homes. Communication, containment, removal, disposal, and restoration just a few examples of the steps that go into a successful remediation effort. And with each new discovery, the teams tasked with managing these sites are finding even better ways to safely remove the threat and to adequately address public concerns. Despite its troubled history, asbestos is still being used in the manufacture of certain building materials. Although the controls and regulations currently in place make it a much safer industry than in years past.